Believe it or not, my job is pretty unique. I'm a wind turbine technician, and yep, I work on those gigantic windmills you often see in big open fields. This particular story happened in the plains of Oklahoma, near the Wichita Mountains. It's a pretty remote area, which is great for wind farms, but sometimes things get, you know, strange. My work mainly involves climbing up the turbines and doing maintenance work. Most of the time, it's just me and the sky up there. The other guys usually stay down on the ground, but honestly, I like the solitude. It gives me time to think, and the view is amazing if you're not scared of heights. But there was this one evening that made me rethink everything. It was getting late, probably around 5.30, and I was just finishing up a routine repair. It had taken longer than expected. As I was about to climb down, I heard something. It wasn't the usual sounds you'd hear up there. I began to descend the turbine, feeling a bit uneasy. The sound had made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Maybe I was just tired after a long day imagining things. I glanced around, scanning the area. Then, in the dim light of my headlamp, I saw it. There, standing before me, was a creature. It looked like a canine, but it was like no dog or wolf I had ever seen. It was huge, almost the size of a small bear, yet it had a sleek, muscular body. Its fur was as black as night, but what caught my attention the most were its sharp teeth, glinting in the faint light. The creature just stood there, a distance away, making it difficult to see clearly in the fading light, but I could feel its eyes on me, watching me intently. I didn't dare move a muscle. Then it howled again, echoing the same eerie sound I heard earlier. It's strange, but at that moment it felt like the sound wasn't just floating in the air. It felt like it was inside me, vibrating through my bones. I've never felt anything like it before. When the creature turned away, I thought that would be the end of it. But as I began to gather my tools, I heard movement. At first, it was barely noticeable, just a faint rustle. So I stopped in my tracks, listening intently, hoping it was just my imagination. But the sound grew louder, the slow, deliberate movements of something large. Quickly, I switched on my headlamp and turned around. The light pierced through the darkness, casting long shadows of the turbines and the vast plains. Where could this sound be coming from? I hurried down the ladder, my hands shaking as I focused on keeping my grip. When I reached the bottom, I looked around and saw it again. The creature was standing on top of a small hill, outlined by the moonlight. It just stood there, watching me, with its red eyes shining in the dark. I quickly jumped into my truck and drove away as fast as I could. Throughout the whole drive, I kept glancing at my mirrors, half expecting to see it chasing after me, but there was nothing behind me. The next few days were tough. I couldn't stop thinking about those glowing red eyes, and I tried to convince myself that maybe it was just a stray dog with a strange appearance, but the way it moved and the intelligence in its eyes didn't seem right for an ordinary dog. I spoke with a person at the local office, casually bringing up the topic of wildlife in the area. One older gentleman, who had lived in the area for a long time, had a different expression compared to the others I had talked to. When I mentioned the creature with red eyes, he became quiet. He warned me to be cautious, saying that there are some things out there that don't like to be disturbed. He didn't say much more, but the seriousness in his voice was clear. Leaving the office that day, I felt a mix of frustration and unease. The encounter and the old man's reaction had sparked a deep curiosity within me. A few nights later, I found myself driving back to the site. I couldn't fully explain why I felt compelled to return, but at first I told myself it would just be a quick drive-by. It was as if something was drawing me back there. However, once I arrived, I felt the urge to get out and investigate. I parked my truck at a distance from the turbine, deciding it was best not to get too close. I walked slowly toward the hill where I had last spotted the creature. Every sense was on alert and every shadow seemed to dance, but there was nothing there. Upon reaching the top of the hill, I gazed out over the plains. The moon illuminated the landscape, and I sat there for a while, observing and listening intently. Yet the creature, the mysterious being, did not make an appearance. I began to visit the site more frequently, always under the cover of night. Although I never laid eyes on the creature again, 
I could sense its presence lingering in the air. Months went by, and my nocturnal visits became a habit. I kept them to myself, knowing how strange it would sound if I shared them with others. But I couldn't resist the pull. It became my secret nightly adventure. Then, one night, while I sat on the hill, I heard the howl once more. It sounded distant this time. But strangely, I didn't feel scared like before. Instead, I felt a sense of finality. It was as if the creature was bidding farewell. After that night, I no longer felt the need to visit the site. It seemed like that chapter of my life had come to an end. Although I still work as a wind turbine technician, I haven't encountered anything quite like that creature since. I can't say for certain what that creature was or why it appeared to me. But regardless, that's my story. You can interpret it however you like, an encounter with the supernatural, or simply a curious person trying to understand the unknown. But it's become a part of me now, a tale woven into the fabric of my life that I doubt I'll ever forget. Hey, I'm Ralph, and let me tell you about something that happened to me in Kootenay National Park in Canada. It's this huge park in the eastern part of British Columbia, not far from Banff. You should check it out sometime if you like forests and mountains. So there I was, hiking and camping in the wilderness. Just me and nature, you know? I love being out there. I set up my camp near Marble Canyon, which is a really beautiful spot. The first few days were pretty normal. I hiked around, cooked some food, and took photos with my camera. Now, I've heard stories about Bigfoot or Sasquatch, whatever you want to call it, but I never really believed them. Until one night something strange happened, and I think I might have seen one for real. It was really late, and the campfire was almost out. I was getting ready to go to sleep when I heard this noise. It wasn't like the usual sounds of the forest. It was heavy, like something big was moving through the trees. At first I thought it might be a bear or a moose, but it felt different. It had a sort of rhythm to it, almost like footsteps. I grabbed my flashlight, and boy do I wish I hadn't. The light sliced through the darkness, and that's when I spotted it. This big creature, covered in fur, standing upright near the trees, and its eyes glinted in the light. I've seen bears before, but this wasn't one. I stood there, staring at it, and it stared right back at me. It felt like forever. Then it made a noise, not mean or scary more like it was wondering about something. My heart was racing, and my flashlight was shaking in my hand. I had just seen something that didn't fit with what I knew about the woods. I kept shining the light where I saw the creature, hoping it would come back, but nothing. Just darkness and the occasional glimmer of light on leaves. I started to doubt myself, wondering if maybe I imagined it all. Too many spooky stories in my head, I guess. But then, I heard it again. That noise like heavy footsteps, but this time it was moving all around the camp. Not fast, but like it was taking its time, going in circles, and my gut told me to leave, but I couldn't move. I called out, hoping maybe it was just someone playing a prank on me, but deep down I knew it wasn't. There was no answer, just those footsteps pacing in the darkness. Then, just as suddenly as it started, it stopped. Everything went quiet again. I stayed put, too scared to budge until the sun came up. The light made the forest look normal again, like nothing strange had happened, but I knew better. The ground around my camp was all messed up, with huge footprints everywhere, and they looked fresh. I've had my fair share of tracking animals. I can spot deer prints from bear prints, but these were unlike anything I'd ever seen. They were too big for a bear, and the way they were spaced out didn't match any animal I knew. They were like human footprints, but enormous almost like they came from a giant in a storybook. Despite my better judgment, I followed them. I was curious, even though I knew I shouldn't be. They led me deeper into the woods, away from the familiar trails and paths. Each step I took made me feel farther from where I was supposed to be, but I couldn't resist. I needed to see where these prints led, to try to understand. Eventually, the prints brought me to a clearing. That's when I stumbled upon something unexpected. It wasn't the creature I'd seen earlier, but something else entirely. It looked like a shelter, but unlike any natural structure I'd ever seen. It was big and made of branches and leaves, carefully put together. 
It felt too intentional to be made by animals, too perfect. And as I stood there, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, like I had stumbled upon something I wasn't supposed to find. I didn't stay long. I quickly snapped a few photos and hurried back to camp. The whole way, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was following me, but every time I looked back, there was nothing there. Just that strange, unsettling feeling. The whole way back, I kept looking behind me, half expecting to see that huge figure following me. But there was nothing, just the normal sounds of the forest waking up. When I finally got back to my car, I sat there for a while, trying to make sense of everything. The pictures I took, the footprints, that strange shelter. It felt like I had all these puzzle pieces, but I couldn't figure out how they fit together. I knew I had found something incredible, something most people wouldn't believe. As soon as I got back to town, I started researching Sasquatch sightings in the Kootenay area. It was like diving into a treasure trove of stories. Some were recent, others went way back. Each one was like a piece of a puzzle, adding to what I had experienced. But even with all this information, I couldn't shake the feeling that I needed to go back to the woods to learn more. At the same time, there was this strange feeling like a warning. It was as if some things are meant to stay hidden, secrets that we're not supposed to uncover. I showed the photos to some people I trust and asked for their thoughts. Most of them thought it might have been a bear or some other animal just seen from a strange angle. But a couple of them, they got quiet when they saw the pictures, like they knew something they didn't want to say. The whole experience changed something inside me. I used to think I knew everything about the woods, that there were no real mysteries left. But now, I'm not so sure. Part of me wants to go back, to find that strange shelter again, maybe even catch another glimpse of the creature. But another part of me knows it's probably better to leave some mysteries alone. So, that's my story. Believe it or not, it's what happened to me out there in the National Park. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? What else could be out there just beyond the light of our campfires watching from the shadows? What do you think? Should I go back someday and try to find it again? Or should I leave it as one of those stories you tell around the fire, a mystery to think about but never really solve? Hitchhikers might make some people nervous, but let me tell you, there are things even scarier out there. I was in Harvey, North Dakota, trying to head south for the winter. I had been working on farms there, but as fall came to an end, so did most of the work. Now, I needed to get all the way to Florida for the citrus season. Problem was, I had more time than money. So I whipped up a sign that simply said South and stationed myself on State Highway 52. You know, interstates are a bit better for hitchhiking. That's because you get truckers cruising along and sometimes they're bored enough to give you a lift. Plus, they're usually not as wary of strangers as regular folks driving their own cars. Settling in for a wait, I plopped down and rested against my sign. It propped up against my feet nicely, but soon a foul smell crept into the air around me. It was strong, coming and going, making me scrunch up my nose. Looking around, I saw nothing but the road stretching ahead with no hint of roadkill and trees lining the sides. At first, I thought it might be my mind playing tricks on me, but then the stench hit me again. Maybe the wind shifted, I thought. Whatever it was, I knew it was time to hit the road. So, I grabbed my stuff and moved on. The trees along the highway didn't catch my eye much at first, but little did I know, they were about to become much more interesting. Now it was early afternoon. I had hit the road around 11 in the morning, leaving behind the motel in Harvey where I had spent the night. Didn't want to start too early, both because I had already paid for the room and because the chilly morning air wasn't inviting. Dragging my pack and sign along the road heading south, I hadn't seen many cars pass by. None had stopped yet. Finally, I decided to take a breather, setting down my pack and leaning against it. I thought I had left that strange smell behind. For a little while, everything seemed all right. I started to forget about the smell altogether, but then it returned, stronger than before. It was like the smell of death, rotting away in the hot sun. I couldn't understand how it had caught up with me. 
I scanned my surroundings again, seeing the same old things. Road, trees, grass. No signs of any dead animals or anything like that. This time, I made up my mind to keep moving, even if it meant walking all the way to the next town. But as I walked, that stinky smell hung around like a bad guest who just won't leave. It made me feel jittery. How could a smell be following me like this? I began to hope even more fervently that a car would come by and scoop me up. After trudging along for about an hour, I couldn't go any farther. Exhausted, I plopped down and tried to calm myself down, but that smell, it just wouldn't let up. As the sun started to set, panic started to creep in. I scanned the surroundings, still seeing nothing but trees and darkness. All I wished for was a cozy, warm car to whisk me away from that place. Spending the night in the woods was the last thing I wanted, especially with that awful smell lurking around. As the sun dipped below the trees, casting long shadows, I couldn't help but glance towards the woods, and there in the darkness I spotted something unsettling. Two glowing red dots, like eyes, staring right at me. My heart skipped a beat and I sprang to my feet, grabbing my pack tightly. Without even realizing it, I found myself walking faster than I ever had before. Every passing car became my hope for rescue, but they all zoomed past, ignoring my frantic waving. Despite my fear, I kept my eyes fixed on the woods as I hurried along, but the red eyes were nowhere to be seen. Eventually, I had to stop and catch my breath. I was completely drained, both physically and mentally. Though the smell still lingered faintly, I began to wonder if maybe I had imagined it all along. I glanced towards the woods once more. And there they were again, those eerie red dots, but this time, they weren't alone. Slowly, a creature emerged from the shadows. My eyes widened in horror as I took in the sight. Above those glowing eyes were massive antlers, like the ones you'd see on a big old buck. But that's where any resemblance to a normal deer ended. This creature's face was nothing but a skull, with rotting flesh hanging off it. Its body was just bones, with bits of decomposing meat clinging to them. Standing on its hind legs, which resembled those of a deer but were much larger, it towered over me at a staggering height of nine or ten feet. But what chilled me to the bone was its grin, or what passed for one on that skull-like face. Those eyes, shining like lasers, seemed to pierce right through me. Every fiber of my being screamed at me to run, but I was frozen in place, and even if I could move, where would I go? This thing had been trailing me all day, I was certain of it. Now that it was out in the open, the stench of death hung heavy in the air, making me gag and feel so sick I thought I might collapse. I felt like giving up. That creature, whatever it was, seemed poised to step out of the woods and do something terrible to me. Maybe even eat me alive. It kept coming closer, its grin wide and grotesque, bits of decaying flesh dropping off it like something out of a zombie movie. Its face was blank, yet somehow filled with evil. Then, as if things couldn't get any worse, the highway lights nearby flickered and went out, plunging us into darkness. The moon offered little help, just a thin sliver in the sky, and any houses were too far away to see. It was so dark I couldn't see the creature anymore, only its glowing red eyes, but I could still smell it, that putrid stench filling my nostrils. And yet, despite its massive size, it moved silently as if gliding towards me, unseen and unheard. I hoisted myself up, my legs wobbly and staggered toward the nearest streetlight. I could sense that creature still trailing me, its presence weighing heavy on my mind, but how close was it? Then the sound of tires on the highway reached my ears. In that moment, I didn't care anymore. This might be my only chance to escape. Summoning all my strength, I stumbled onto the highway, blinded by the approaching headlights. I wanted to collapse right then and there, but instead I raised my arms in desperation. Miraculously, the truck spotted me and screeched to a halt by the roadside. As the driver rolled down his window, I blurted out, Something's chasing me! Please let me in! He hesitated for a moment, sniffing the air, then spoke with urgency. The Wendigo! Get in! Quick! With that, I clambered into the safety of the truck. That was the day a stranger saved my life. He knew all about the Wendigo, that terrifying creature that had been stalking me. In fact, he was the one who had told me about your show. He urged me to share my story with you, saying it might be a good fit for your channel. 
and so here I am hoping my tale will find a place among your listeners. I grew up in a teeny tiny town nestled in Vermont. Imagine a place with barely 600 folks living there, and that's where I lived. Our town was so small that all the kids, including me, had to hop on a bus and ride for half an hour to go to high school. We shared our school with two other districts, but ours was the littlest of them all. There was this boy I really liked, and he wasn't from my town, though. He was the kind of guy who seemed out of reach, you know? A real star at school, always smiling and surrounded by friends. One day during lunch when I was in the 11th grade, one of my pals dared me to go ask him out. I was nervous at first, but then I thought, why not? I figured it wouldn't matter much if things went south. So I mustered up my courage and walked over to his table. People started giving me curious looks, but I focused on him. I introduced myself and popped the question, trying my best to act cool. To my surprise, he said yes. He even invited me to a party that night. I was over the moon, but my friends weren't so sure, and they kept saying it was probably a joke, that a cool guy like him wouldn't be interested in someone like me. Their words really hurt. I didn't want them to ruin my excitement, so I decided to leave school early. I ignored the phone calls when I got home, thinking they were just my friends trying to mess with me. As the evening approached, I headed out to the party. The road was empty, and my town felt unusually quiet. I stopped at a gas station to fill up, but there was nobody there to help. I did it myself and drove off. The back roads in Vermont can be spooky, especially at night, and that night was no different. Even though I was alone, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Suddenly, I felt a chill run down my spine, so I pulled over and got out to stretch. But when I looked up, I saw something strange in the sky, a dark shape hovering silently above me. It scared me, but I couldn't look away. Then, it moved closer, and I panicked. I raced back to town, my heart pounding in my chest. I made it back, but my gas tank was nearly empty, even though it was full just moments ago. It felt like whatever was in the sky had drained it somehow. I was relieved to see the streetlights as I entered town. The next morning, I woke up at the gas station, confused and shaken. Despite not making it to the party, something changed inside me that night. I felt stronger, more confident. Surviving that strange experience made me realize I was capable of handling whatever life threw at me. I've been listening to this podcast for a long time, and now I'm finally sharing my own story. It's not something I talk about often, because people might react strangely. But here goes, I grew up in a house where strange things happened. My childhood home wasn't spooky like in the movies. It was just a regular house in a regular neighborhood, on a cul-de-sac. Things were pretty normal until my mom unexpectedly passed away when I was nine, and it was tough for all of us. After she died, strange stuff started to happen. At first it was small things like the TV remote moving or doors opening by themselves. Then it got more obvious. Stuff would disappear and show up in different rooms. Sometimes I'd hear footsteps in the hallway at night. My mom had a sewing room where she spent a lot of time. She'd make all sorts of things there, and it's where she passed away. My dad didn't want to get rid of her stuff, so we left it as it was. I like spending time in there, and sometimes I'd smell her perfume, which made me feel like she was still around, checking in on us. My dad and brother noticed some of the weird things happening too, but my dad didn't like it when I said it might be mom's ghost. So, I kept quiet about it. Then I started seeing a shadow. It would dart out of the sewing room, and sometimes I'd see a figure in the hallway. It wasn't like mom's presence. It felt different, darker. Once I fell asleep in the sewing room and heard mom's voice whisper my name. When I woke up, the shadow was there, and I felt this urgent need to leave. I ran out and my dad and brother saw scratches on me. They didn't believe what I saw and my dad got mad. After that I stayed away from the sewing room but I'd still smell mom's perfume and hear her voice when I was alone. I was scared but I finally told my brother and he believed me. He thought dad was hiding something but we didn't know what. When we moved out a year later the strange stuff stopped. But now, years later, it's starting again. 
I smell mom's perfume, hear her voice, and see shadows. I don't know what's going on, but it's real to me. I'm scared about what might happen next. <laughs>